Good afternoon, everyone. This is Marcus Rodi, your host for this program. You, I'm assuming some of you have heard our Deep in Scripture programs. This is a brand new program, which we're just starting called Deep in History. And it's coming to you from the studios of the Coming Home Network International. Again, thank you for joining us. I'm the president and founder of the Coming Home Network International. You may also be familiar with my work with EWTN and the Journey Home program. Now for, oh boy, over 25, almost 27 years, I've been uh, working with the Coming Home Network. And our work with the Coming Home Network is to help our non-Catholic Christian brothers and sisters discover the beauty of the Catholic faith. And it's all about telling, and often it involves telling stories uh, about what the Holy Spirit has done in our lives. And so we've decided with the other programs that we do that for a long time we've thought about this new program, which we're calling Deep in History. And so you're tuning in to the very first episode. But I'm not on this program alone. I am joined, very great privilege to be joined by uh, if you will, a, a, not only just a friend, but a co-worker here at the Coming Home Network, and that's Monsignor Jeffrey Steenson, who comes from us from Minneapolis, St. Paul. And let me make sure, Monsignor Steenson, are you on the other end of the line? I'm here in St. Paul. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Which is a long way from Minneapolis. So. Oh, okay. I wasn't real sure. I'm, I'm down here in Ohio, so I... Uh, they're, they're very close to one another compared to you and me over this internet connection. Yeah. Geographically, they're close. Um, culturally, they're separated. So, <laughs> But it's a great privilege to be joined by, by you, Monsignor. Thank you so much for, for doing this program with us. You and I have talked about this for a while. And uh, finally, by God's grace, we're, we're going to start it. Um, we'll see how it goes next week because uh, audience I'll be facing shoulder surgery. So we'll just play it by ear. But uh, I've been anxious to, to start this program. And I thought in this introductory program, I've invited Monsignor just and I, we're going to take some time to talk about the theme of the program, deep in history, why we call it that, the importance of being deep in history, how it's affected our lives, and why we're choosing the subject that we'll be focusing on in the coming weeks, a study of St. Irenaeus's Against Heresy. So let me, if I will, uh, Monsignor, throw it to you. And again, maybe I should also invite you to real quickly, uh, the audience may not know you, so maybe just a little bit of your background, and then talk about the phrase deep in history and give us a little bit of, from your perspective, the history of why that title or theme for this series. Well, thank you, Marcus. Um, it's a great pleasure to be with you. I've um, been in love with the fathers of the church all my adult life. Um, I started, I discovered them as a seminary student at an evangelical seminary. And, um, and it was just the desire to learn more about them and go deeper that uh, took me um, ultimately, to I did my doctorate in patristics at Oxford University um, back in the in the early 1980s, and um, and so the fathers have been with me this whole part of my, all my life um, through my ministry, and uh, and it's just a surpassing joy to talk about them. You know, it's funny uh, when I hear you describe that, Monsignor, because you and I have different paths in our in our spiritual walks. Um, when I was in seminary, of course, I knew about Luther and Calvin and the Reformers, uh, being brought up Lutheran and then later, later a Congregationalist before I went to seminary. But I was like so many other Protestants that uh, I knew about the Reformers, but I knew about very few Christians between the Apostles and, and Martin Luther and Calvin and Zwingli and Bucer and that whole gang in the 16th century. I really knew very few. I knew Augustine was in there somewhere and St. Francis was in there somewhere. But other than that, I certainly had never read anything by Aquinas. I just was ignorant of, and ignorant yeah. of St. Irenaeus and Ignatius and Justin Martyr and all that. I didn't know that. So when I was in seminary, I did become deep in the fathers. But the fathers I became deep in 
were Jonathan Edwards, Richard Baxter, Isaac Watts. Yeah. You know, to me, those were the fathers behind my particular angle of Christianity. And they extended to J.I. Packer, and they extended to C.S. Lewis and that whole group. Those were the fathers. But they didn't go much farther back than that. So it wasn't until my own journey that I discovered them. And I know that that in many ways for you, like John Henry Cardinal Newman, the discovery in a deeper way of the of of, of the apostolic fathers was a big part of your journey. It was. And, and I remember as a young man meeting um, lots of these extraordinary characters that you will remember too, like Bob Weber at Wheaton College. And the, the idea of, um, I think probably from them, I began to learn this concept of going deep in history. Um, it was the idea that we live today in a, a church that's so divided. So why don't we go backwards and try to find our faith in what used to be called the undivided church? It, it was always divided, obviously, but but not quite so badly. And um, and and that was one of the things that spurred us on to you know to to begin to go deeper and and not just to not just to kind of pick out Augustine here, a little bit of Augustine here, or a little bit of Athanasius there, or going forward with Thomas and all that, but to actually to meet the fathers in the world in which they they lived and served and ministered, the church that they they loved and gave their lives for. So it, it meant really engaging with them, um, not from our point of view or our perspective, but to really try to stand in their shoes. And that exercise was just so profoundly important in terms of getting me out from the presuppositions that I I came with. When I was in seminary, we had a book. I can't remember the title, Early Christian Writings or or something, Documents of the Church or something like that. Right. That I remember reading. And what it did is it began from the beginning, and the first chapter was on the creeds, and then it it slowly went through century, century by century with quotes from different writers, bishops, leaders in the church. And the way it was written, and in fact, I didn't have to read everything. My professor had selected which of those readings for us to read, that I essentially walked away from the idea that my present understanding of evangelical Christianity had therefore been present from the very beginning because we were reading quotes and threads from the very beginning that reinforced my modern way of understanding evangelicalism. Right, right. I can can remember one of my early seminary professors saying um, that uh, he basically accepted the point that uh, in, in with the reformers in the 16th century, the church, after centuries, found her way back to the gospel again. But he admitted that every once in a while, the Holy Spirit would pop up in the earlier history of the church. But it wasn't it wasn't the church. It was just the Holy Spirit moving in the lives of individuals. And I, I found that a totally impossible well, thing to... You know. I look back on that study that I had back in seminary. I didn't remember the names of any of those people in those years in between, to a certain extent, they weren't important. What was important was that they were channels of the way the Holy Spirit was guiding this thread of the gospel that came to life today in evangelicalism. That's the way that I saw it. And I do remember, for example, I I do remember reading the quote from Justin Martyr about how they worshipped there in the second century. Mm-hmm. The only reason I remember it was Justin Martyr is because later, as a in my journey to Catholic Church, I reread that, and I discovered that when I read it back twenty some years ago, I only read the section that described the worship service, just like the worship we do now. You know, right. get together, they read memoirs of the apostles. Somebody gives a sermon, you know, and then they have prayers, and then they go out and have the Lord's Supper and pass it out. But we skip the big section on both baptism and the Eucharist. Mm-hmm. It's kind of like later when I uh, 
read Thomas Akempis's book on the imitation of Christ. So in the long stream, the thread throughout history, that would have been, I think, in the 14th century or 15th century. I forget, it was before, it was 13-something, I think. Yeah. When, so, yeah. so we're talking the 14th century, uh, 150 years or so before the Protestant reformers. You know, here's the thread. Here's evangelicalism. Here's giving yourself to Jesus Christ. It's just that when I read Imitation of Christ, I was only required to read chapters one, two, and three. We skipped book four, which was about the Eucharist. And so you can read the Imitation of Christ and not even know that he was Catholic. Right. And so you can, that, that is a way of reading history. The question is, is it becoming deep in history? And Monsignor, I know that John Henry Cardinal Newman had a huge place to play in your journey. And the truth is that this phrase, deep in history, that the way we use it in our work comes from Newman himself. Yeah, for me, it was, it, I, I think we both probably about the same time encountered um, uh, his essay on the development yeah. of the doctrine. Uh, that that was a very um, pivotal moment in my development. And I I can remember just being bowled over by that language in the introduction. Um, to be deep in history is to cease to be a Protestant. Um, if ever there was a, a sure truth, the, the um, Christianity of history is not Protestantism. I probably misquoted that a little bit, but um, it it had a great impact on, on me. And uh, I suppose for, because I was Anglican, I, I was identifying with his journey in so many ways. Um, but I think people across the spectrum have have been incredibly blessed by um by Newman and his his passion for yeah that i mean i always i'm always fascinated marcus by um listening to modern uh roman catholic theologians talking about how important Newman was in teaching the catholic church uh how to do historical theology, <laughs> how to think, how to think his, you know, and even today, you know, as we prepare um, for in the formation of priests, uh, the Holy See talks about how important it is that we use a genetic model of instruction. And the whole idea is to be able to show um, to students how it is that the, the whole of, of Catholic life and thought fits together. And, and Newman is the one that really had the passion for explicating that. Newman's big challenge during his own time of, of discovering the Catholic Church and, and, and struggling as to whether he should stay in Anglican and see it as a middle way or whether he should be, eventually become Catholic came down to a, a study of the early church fathers it began with his study of the 4th century Arian controversy, but then led to this struggle of the issue of development. And, and that was, how do you understand the fact that uh, the church teaches things differently in the 3rd century, in the 6th century, in the 9th century, in the 14th century, and on, than it did as we find them in the Gospels? How do we explain that? And you know, the, one of the most clearest examples is the, the definitions of things like the Trinity, the divinity of Christ, the persons in the Trinity, the persons in Christ, the wills mm -hmm. in Christ. How do you understand those things? As they were defined in the 4th century at Nicaea, Chalcedon, Constantinople later in the 5th century, or I forget which century they were. How do you understand whether they're true? How do you accept them as true when they are defined or more clearly expressed in the 5th century mm -hmm. than they were in the 2nd century? And so one example is, is we see the, the growth of the authority of the Bishop of Rome. We see the establishment of the canon of Scripture which comes together in an official way at the end of the 4th century. 
It wasn't there in the second century, although we'll see almost every book quoted in Irenaeus, but it yeah. wasn't defined. Yeah. So how do you understand that? And that's what Newman struggled with, because there were different opinions on that. There was one view, and that was that Jesus, in the 40 days that he met with his apostles after his resurrection until his ascension, gave them everything we would ever need to know, but it was kept protected and private until there became times when it had to be revealed. And that was called the apostolic secret. Yeah. And many believed that was it. So there was really nothing, nothing ever new. It just became explicit because before it had been not just implicit, but kept, their cards were kept close to their chest, as you would say. Um, another view was that, and this was later in the, I think during the Enlightenment period, I think it was the idea that the changes came about as, as we became wiser as a civilization. And so logically and reason helped us glean from what previous people hadn't quite gleaned yet. I'm, I'm being kind of cynical when I say this, but you know, I hear you. Yeah. That, that, that it was, it was our wisdom, our growth and reason, our growth and understanding. And of course, this you could see would be a time of the Enlightenment. And Newman saw it a little bit differently. And I might ask you to describe, because I think you understood him a little bit better than me. I still to this day agree with it, but I still sometimes struggle with being able to describe his developmental idea. Well, you've you've been through it recently. I haven't. So um, I, will, I will certainly yield to you on this. But my recollection that what Newman, um, his, his principal insight was to say that the development of doctrine was an organic thing. So you imagine um, we begin with a seed and it sprouts and you have a little sapling and eventually it grows into a mighty tree and it is genetically the same thing. Um, but as, you know, as, as it grows, as uh, the church, you know, expands and, and, um, um, matures, if you will, in its journey through this time and this world, um, we begin to see things that were only sort of, were only kind of, they were latent, if you will, in the, in the seed, but they've come forth now. Would you say that, is that? Yeah. And, I mean, it's and, been years since I've put, tried to put that into words. So. I know, and, and I still <laughs> struggle a little bit, but it isn't that, it isn't that it was just secret in its full form, and then right. became explicit, nor is it that it's because we begot, became smarter. It, no. it may be that in time, given the, the struggles of the church in a given period, uh, that the questions were raised in a way they were never before, and so the Holy Spirit helped us as a church see more clear that what, what in essence was always true, but just more implicit. Yes. Yeah. Um, and I think, I think, I think Newman learned some of that from, I mean, in the early church, one of the great, uh, St. Basil the Great, his, um, his books on the Holy Spirit, he addresses that very point. Why doesn't, why doesn't scripture speak specifically about the divinity of the Holy Spirit? And he, he developed, or he tried to articulate a model of doctrinal development that is very similar to Newman, I think. Yeah, and part of it came from trusting that the Holy Spirit that our Lord promised to his apostles in chapters 14, 15, 16, and 17 of, of John were not just given universally to everybody the way I took it, is that in the context, Jesus was speaking to his apostles promising that the Holy Spirit would help them remember everything that he had taught and guide yes. them into truth. And that becomes a foundation. And, and the truth yeah. is that in history, when we go back and we recognize why is it that we have this book we call the Bible, this collection of Old Testament books, deuterocanonical books, and New Testament books, why this particular collection, 
is because we believe that the Holy Spirit guided the church in its wisdom to select which books were to be in the canon and which ones were not. The Gospel of Thomas was not. The book of Revelation was. The Shepherd of Hermas, it's a great book, but not in the canon. The Didache, a wonderful book, but not in the canon. The Letter of Clement, great book, but not in the canon. Possibly written during at least Clement and the Didache, written about the same time as some of the New Testament letters. Some, some people used to consider it a part of the canon, but why not? Because we trust that the Holy Spirit guided the bishops. In the end, because there was challenge by, I think it was, was it Marcion? One of them had a, a reduced canon. Marcion, yeah. You know, that's so right. all of a sudden, he's, he's, he's trimming the Old Testament. He's trimming up the book of Luke, and he's, he, he's narrowing it down. And so the bishops had to decide. And the issue was not which of these books historically can we trust when we sit down to Bible study, it was which of these books can we trust ought to be read in liturgy. That was the issue. When the, when the Christians are gathered for Mass, which of these books should be read as authoritative, mm -hmm. inspired, infallible, as a part of the Word? That was the decision, because that's what was being challenged. Yeah, the authentic voice of the apostles. Yeah. So, yeah. It, you know, all this to say this is why history is important. When I was a Protestant minister, I believe that the Bible was the sole foundation for truth. But if somebody pulled me aside and challenged me, where would we get that book from? I had an opinion, but what was it based on? What about those, that collection of books? Yeah. Why those? I had an opinion. I had things that I picked up along the way. But were they historically accurate? And to a certain extent, I was torn between, on the one hand, recognizing the beauty of history, because I love to study history anyway, but being a little bit nervous about history. What would, what would I find? Um, I had known people that were great historians but had lost their faith in the process. Um, so what about being deep in history? Let me ask you that, Monsignor. You, in fact, you told me something you discovered recently about that quote from Newman. I mean, it, it, is, is his statement to become deep in history to cease to be Protestant an axiom of truth? Well, I, I, we were talking about that. That's fascinating. I, I've got. I haven't had a chance to really chase down the different editions of that work, but it it doesn't seem like it appears in my copy of the the original edition of it, which makes sense because he was yep. still Anglican as he was working on this. But um, yep. but I, you know, I think I think um, I, I'm sure that Newman would 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 say this if we were able to ask him as too. Um, we can have confidence as we make this journey if we're if we're if we if we're truly humble and willing to listen carefully as we go deep in history um, as we meet the fathers and doctors of the church and as we assimilate their spirit and make them our friends we can have confidence that um, um, because they were faithful to the church, they were faithful to Christ. Um, it gives us confidence that in the Holy Spirit, we our growth and understanding is protected. We, you know, if we stay within, I like to. I used to think about it as um, the fathers of the church, because I love flying. So I, I always thought of the fathers of the church as runway lights. <laughs> and you, you're approaching a, a runway as at sunset. And, um, you know, without the help of those lights, you could easily veer off into the ditch. And if you just 
kind of keep your whole ship oriented to those lights. Yeah, they're a sure guide, and I I, I think of the fathers of the church that way. Um, I I have a slightly slightly different view, only from the okay. standpoint that you and I both recognize that the fathers of the church aren't infallible. Right. Yeah. I mean, Absolutely. so, so my, so my only clarification is that it's not like the early church fathers gave this straight white lights, you know, yeah. like you would see if you were coming down to an, an airfield and land and it's foggy out, all you see are these lights. Well, you know, Origen and Tertullian, are, some of their lights are a little off base, right? And even right. the best of them. I've got a few quotes by Augustine that I'm saying, you know, that's why later in life, Augustine apparently had to do some retractionis. Uh, right. So, you know, a good pilot would say, a uh, uh, flight instructor would say, don't fixate on any one of those lights. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but in my mind, that's what the church became for me, yeah. is that the, the trajectory of the church guided by the Holy Spirit. We believe that to be true. And so we look at the early fathers through the lines of the church. Now, not everyone I've ever met or know about in life who are historians have become Catholic, nor have they ceased to be Protestant. And so how do one, does one describe that? You know, it, it's not like a, an automatic formula. For those of you that are Catholics, you wonder, how do I get my non-Catholic friends to discover the beauty of the church? Well, you know, just give them a history book and it'll guarantee it won't. And one of the reasons is, here's a good example. If you ask somebody, what was the reasons, the primary reason for the American Revolution? Or what was the primary motive behind the American Civil War? Or if you ask, what were the big flaws of the Revolution or the flaws of the Civil War? Well, it depends on which history book you read and what time period you read. The American Revolution, you know, people, most of in the 20th century, beginning in the late 19th century, only looked at the American Revolutionary through economic glasses. It was all about the Stamp Act. It was all about taxes. That was what it was all about. Well, the truth is that I have a quote from Sam Adams. When Sam Adams stood before the con First Continental Congress, and Sam Adams said that he more feared the Quebec Act than the Stamp Act. Does anybody any more know what the Quebec Act was? We all know what the Stamp Act is, but... Do you know what the Quebec Act is? Monsieur? I'm sorry, I don't. I don't. The Quebec Act was an act of parliament in 1773 that legitimated the Catholic Church in Canada, in Quebec. So from then on, the Catholic Church could remain fully legal in Canada. They had a bishop in Quebec. Mm -hmm. All the French Catholics in Canada could live their Catholic light with life with complete freedom in Canada. They couldn't do it in England, and they couldn't do it in the American colonies, but they could in Canada. Now, why would England do that, and why would that put fear in the hearts of Sam Adams, John Adams, uh, Bullfinch, and others? Because all of a sudden, the American colonies were surrounded by papism. <laughs> to the north, up and down the Mississippi River, and in Florida. Yeah. They more feared the fact that the Antichrist, the papists, would infiltrate the American colonies than they were the Stamp Act. And that's Sam Adams. If you read wow. an American history book in the early 19th century, it would talk about the fear of the Catholic Church, especially during the time of the know-nothings in the 1820s and 30s. It's not anywhere today. No, it's only economics. Same thing with the Civil War. Same thing with, the, you know, why the Civil War? Today, it's all about slavery. Well, for a lot of people, it was about states' rights. You know, so it depends. So being deep in history, the danger is 
do we identify the lenses through which we look at the third century, the second century, the first century? How do we do that? And um, if you're always going back to only find what you already have, you know, when one uh, series of books I read about history was written by a professor from Yale named uh, La Salette. Is that right? I think that was it, La Salette. I think he was a professor at Yale, wrote a seven-volume history of the church. And his entire understanding of the history of the church was looking at it through the eyes of mission and evangelization. So in some sense, the characters weren't important. It was just the spread of the gospel. It wasn't about the structures, and they were just impeded the spread of the gospel. So if you look at it from one lens, you'll see it one way. Yeah. Which yeah. in my mind, Father, gets gets us to the question of the of the topic that we're looking at, because to me, to become deep in history is to examine the primary sources. I mean, isn't that, that's I mean, right. really, that's what we're going to look at. And and I we talked about this a little bit. I I've, I've been one of the most spectacular essays I found that C.S. Lewis ever wrote was called "On the Reading of Old Books," hmm. and it's published as a foreword or as an introduction to this uh, work, Saint Athanasius on the Incarnation. Um, uh, but it's also published in different other forms. But but C.S. Lewis's point was. Um, if we want to go deep in history, it's just not sufficient to pick up a modern historian and read his book, a secondary source, as we'd call it. You know, yeah. you got to go back to the old books and to the primary authors. And in his essay, he, he encourages readers to do it, to not be afraid of it. You know, um, uh, uh, he we can only we we can only do this if we're willing to um, uh, make that um, effort to try to read the old books and the old authors. And he he the, I love this little description um, about how it is that we need to kind of be able to look beyond the presuppositions and prejudices of our time. The only palliative is to keep the clean sea breezes of the centuries blowing through our minds. And this can only be done by reading old books. <laughs> um, and, and he goes on to say, not of course that there is any magic about the past. People were no cleverer than they are now. They made as many mistakes as we, but not the same mistakes. <laughs> Oh boy! Uh, it's just a marvelous kind of perspective on this that Lewis brings to it. it to me, yeah. one of the biggest fallacies that we are blind to in our culture is this idea that somehow we are smarter and yeah. wiser and more educated, more intelligent today than they were back in the first, second, third, fourth, fifth century. And you don't have to read very far in any of the primary sources of those centuries to realize that there's no difference in those things. They may have received different data when they studied. Mm -hmm. They may not have ever heard of electricity or an automobile or a cell phone, but their understanding of, of life and of the world and, and even of science in many ways is absolutely astounding, uh, which is sometimes why they're hard to read because yeah. it's not that they're rambling in their thoughts as I often do, <laughs> it, is that they, their, their logic and their reasoning, their, their expression of ideas is profound, which is why we... We approach the early church fathers and their writings. We don't want to approach them in the same way that some approach Bible alone. All I need is this Bible. I don't need anything else. I don't need to know anything. Excuse me. I don't know what caused it. We don't need anything about history. We don't need to know anything about the background or the context. I just need this book. And when we do that, we, 
we, we miss the point of so much because so much of what was written is in context. So when we read the early church fathers, it's important to understand their life, their context, what was going on. To me, a good example of how we miss that is that we'll go back and we'll read stories about the, the monks like Anthony who left the city to go live in a cave. And we try and, and imagine that. How could we do that? Without recognizing that there's a radical difference between the city that Anthony left and the life he chose compared to the, if we did that today. Because he didn't have running water, he didn't have indoor plumbing, he didn't have electricity, he didn't have indoor heating, he didn't have automobiles or anything. That, or the internet, you know. He didn't have the internet, he didn't have any. He didn't. He, so in other words, what he gave up was, you know, he went from a little shack in town to a cave. There was no, not a lot of difference in the way he lived. So what he left behind was different than we'd have to leave behind. I'm not putting his sacrifice mm -hmm. down, but the context is different. To understand what it was he saw we had to give up. It was different than what we would have to give up if we left and lived in a cave, which we couldn't even do. Right. You know, but, but anyway, we're going to, so we're, we're going to focus on this and we've chosen a wonderful book. Uh, a book called Against Heresies by St. Irenaeus. Now, next week, we're going to go into the details of the background of that book, and then the week after that, we'll start getting into the guts of it. So next week, we'll talk more in detail about it. But maybe just one last little thought, Father, this is a, is a wetting the, the tongue yeah. a little bit about wetting the lips about why Irenaeus and Against Heresies? I'll give you a, I'll give you just a couple of things that really jump out at me. One is, of course, this is perhaps the first systematic theologian of the church. So, um, so Irenaeus, that's the way we've taught it in England, but okay. or Irenaeus here in the United States. Um, w one of the things that Irenaeus provides us with is we, that's our first real chance to see um, the apostolic faith gathered together, um, basically as as one account of it, and um, and so that's very special. He he's also incredibly important to um, to Christian people today of all ecclesial stripes because he's he's a wonderful meeting ground. <laughs> Protestants find so much in in him. Catholics find so much in him, and so there's a wonderful chance to meet and talk and to um, learn about each other as we go deeper into into Saint Irenaeus. Um, and you know, the other thing I might say is, um, I was privileged at the USCCB meeting this past November to be a part of this remarkable um, moment um, when. The bishops unanimously, apparently that was, they haven't seen unanimous at the USCCB for a <laughs> long time, unanimously supported the Archbishop of Lyon in France um, in his petition to have St. Irenaeus declared a doctor of the church. And so that's happening. It's ha As we speak, that's happening. And I think it would just be a marvelous opportunity for people to get to know this newest doctor of the church that I would think we'll, we'll see some declaration in the near future about. Yeah, I, I couldn't agree with you more on, on what you said, Monsignor. I remember when, in fact, it hasn't been that long ago that I read, a year ago actually, that I read the whole book from cover to cover. It's a big book. And the first couple chapters are, are pretty difficult because of the subject matter that that Irenaeus is covering, the heresies of his time period that were attacking his people. And so as a bishop, he was trying to help the people get through it. But 
as you mentioned, for me, why this book was so important, uh, it, it was written about 175 A.D. Yeah. So if you think Roughly, about, yeah. if you think about when that was, everyone, he was. We believe that he learned his faith from a man by the name of Polycarp, who learned his faith from a man by the name of John, who was converted to the faith by a man by the name of Jesus. <laughs> So we have Jesus to John to Polycarp to Irenaeus. And so I've often used this analogy of, let's say, Henry Ford visited his automobile plants from time to time, and he'd watch the guys making the cars, and once in a while he'd leave a note, you know, put, you know use a different screw in that place. Or the next day he'd leave a note, you know, why don't you buff up that fender before you put it on? Or another day... Let's put a third tire in, whatever. He little notes, okay, over the years. And then when Henry Ford dies, the people collect all those little notes and they put it together. Now, the question is, if you collected all those little notes, would that give you all the instructions you needed to live the entire, to build a, a car? And the, mm. of course, no. Most of what's built about building a car, he assumed everybody knew. He was just correcting things and encouraging things. Well, in a way, that's like what we have in the New Testament. We have the stories of Christ, but the teachings that applied the teachings of Christ to the people were little notes here and there. A note Paul would write, or a note James would write, or a note that Peter would write, or a note that John would write. So we get little bits that are put together. But in my mind, Irenaeus is the first time that the thinking taught by Christ through the continuity of the Old Testament salvation history into the New Testament, and as it, it's the first time that somebody put it down that was in more than a letter, and it was in the context of preventing people from being drawn away into these false teachings. The other thing that I absolutely was profoundly startled by, which is why we encourage this particular edition that we're going to be using of the study is that the index shows that Irenaeus knew the Bible almost more than any of us today. Yes. It's just, he didn't have a concordance. He didn't have a computer. Isn't he, that amazing? It's, it's amazing. absolutely astounding how much he quoted from Scripture, New Testament, as well as yeah. old. So maybe as we close with Monsignor, why don't you even hold up and talk about the edition that we're using and how people can get it if they want to follow along. Yeah, this is this edition, um, which is actually it was published quite recently um, uh, by Neshota House, um, uh, which is an Episcopalian seminary. Uh, Neshota House Press published it in the United States in 2012, but it it's. It was um, originally published uh, in 1872, um, translated by John Keeble, who was one of, um, John Keeble was one of the great uh, colleagues of John Henry Newman at the beginning of the Oxford movement. Yeah. Um, and John Keeble did not swim the Tiber. He remained an Anglican all of his life. Um, uh, but a fine, fine scholar. And um, it's just remarkable that we're using a, a text like this um, in the context of who we are in the Coming Home Network. Um, and I, so, yeah. I was going to say, and one of the reasons, I think one of the values of, of, of this particular translation, which may be more available through Anglican eyes than if it were done through a Catholic translator. And I'm sure there are fine Catholic translations. I don't want Oh, to, sure. But, yeah. But so he points out everywhere he can when Irenaeus quotes a scripture, when he quotes the father of the church, and it's in the sides of each page and a huge index in the back. Because for John Keeble, it was important to show where Irenaeus was quoting scripture. And that particularly comes out through this Anglican translator, but it's a wonderful translation. And, and I, don't, uh, it, I haven't I haven't looked to see if this is available um, as a free download online. I thought the one you sent me was that very one. 
It, did I? Maybe yeah. I did. I've forgotten yeah. it then. Yeah, yeah. Because there's another there's another 19th century translation that's out there, um, published as part of the Anti Nicene Fathers, <laughs> and that one um, that's not the same as this one. Um, yeah. That's a totally different one. Um, this is, I think, just a remarkable effort yeah. by Keeble. Um, and it just fits our purposes better, I think, in some ways. And there, of course, there are modern Catholic, there are modern translations as well. But the problem with the modern translations are that they are so expensive to purchase yeah. um, from yeah. the fathers of the church or the anti uh, or the ancient Christian writers series or something like that. They they are very expensive, and this is something that's much more accessible. To uh, us. I'll also say that this particular translator, because he was Anglo-Catholic, was not hesitant to let the Irenaeus speak the way he spoke. He wasn't hesitant if it sounded too Catholic. He wasn't yeah. pulling back from that. So it, it's really well translated. Plus, it was the translation was done long before modern political correctness. Yes. So it's a clear translation. And I will say, if you go to the website, chnetwork.org, I'm pretty sure one of the staff is going to put the link up so that, you can, okay. you can find the free ebook of this. What Monsignor held up, you can buy through Amazon.com if you want a hard copy, but you can get the entire translation available on the internet. All right. Monsignor, as we close, I'd like to ask you for a final prayer and blessing. Yeah, I picked a prayer that I wanted to use today um, from um, uh, a man who was just a few years later than Irenaeus, of all people, origin. Oh. <laughs> yes. A Prayer for Insight, it's called. And it was published in a wonderful manual for prayers that I, I <laughs> bought years ago that, uh, from the North American College in Rome. I, I just love this prayer. May the Lord Jesus touch our eyes as he did those of the blind. Then we shall begin to see invisible things, those which are invisible. May he open our eyes to gaze not on present realities, but on the blessings to come. May he open the eyes of our heart to contemplate God in spirit through Jesus Christ, our Lord, to whom belong power and glory through all eternity. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Monsignor. Okay. Thank you very much. And look forward to joining you next week. As next week, what we'll do is we'll talk about the context, the introduction to the book, what was going on at the time, how to understand him in his historical context. Uh, and, uh, and then we'll pick up the next week and digging in to that very difficult, if you will, first chapter. Thank you, Monsignor. And thank you all thank for joining so us much. on this episode of Deep in History. Look forward to being with you again next week. God bless.